Sure, go ahead. Yeah. So, hello everyone. Welcome to Friday Hack uh, 208. So, we will have two speakers today, and here comes our first speaker, Prof. Martin Hans. Yeah, so let's welcome him. All right. I'm uh, uh, very pleased to be here and to share some ideas with you this evening on the Source Academy and the system that we've been building here in the School of Computing. Um, but I also uh, would like you to take you into the history of computing uh, because I think this effort connects to um, the last 50 or even 60 years of computing. Take this one. Uh, so Source Academy, past, present, and future. Um, I'm going to uh, take a look at this SICP book that gave rise to this whole thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about JavaScript and then get into the Source Academy and uh, uh, talk about how the concepts of the textbook uh, were adapted to this language JavaScript. So let's start with the textbook SICP. It is called the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. And uh, it is sort of an, a hallmark in the uh, history of computer science education. Uh, because prior to that point in, the, in uh, 1984, when the first edition of the book came out, uh, programming was taught um, as an, a skill, as, as something that you pick up, uh, like you pick up an, uh, an, an, uh, a craft. So you need to learn the, the, a particular programming language, and you need to learn how to solve problems using that language. SICP is different. It uh, focuses on the underlying concepts, on the underlying mental models of what happens when computer programs run. And SICP um, was developed uh, in a particular uh, period of time. So let me take you back to uh, the uh, nine, to the uh, ancient history of computer science. And of course, you know, the first uh, computers came out in uh, the late 1940s. And then um, there were mostly assembly programming. Um, then you had the language Fortran in the 1950s and uh, 19, around 1960, a breakthrough because the first really high level languages uh, came up. And uh, the, uh, what can be considered the grandfather of all modern programming languages is the language Lisp. Uh, it has already in it uh, many features of the languages that you know. It comes with a pretty awkward syntax, but I'll talk a bit more about that syntax. Uh, but that was an, a breakthrough. Uh, but then what happened in uh, 19... In the, in, the 19, uh, in the 1970s, uh, the language scheme was developed as an effort to clean up, to clean up Lisp. And I'll discuss this in a bit more detail in a few minutes. Then, uh, and, and that was done at MIT. So Abelson, uh, uh, Sussman, uh, Gerald Sussman and Guy Steele developed scheme in the 1970s. And then Abelson and Sussman came up with the textbook SICP in 1984 after teaching already um, following this sort of material for a few years. So that was the first edition of SICP. Um, So what we can uh, say then is that um, this language Lisp, if this is the language Lisp, right, as the grandfather of all the languages, uh, what you can think of is Scheme as a branch off from Lisp. So that is Scheme. Um, and SICP, of course, used uh, used the language scheme. 
So what happened then um, was the, the PC and all of that stuff that happened in the 80s. And in uh, 1995, there was a major, uh, or in the, the early 1990s, the, the World Wide Web became uh, of uh, widespread use. And then in, uh, in uh, 1995, uh, the first commercial uh, browser, that was the Netscape browser, uh, was uh, developed by the company Netscape. So this is 1995. Now, the uh, company Netscape wanted to uh, create, wanted to allow dynamic web pages. So before that, it was uh, HTML was the underlying uh, format for uh, sharing information on the, on the web, uh, developed at CERN. And uh, Netscape wanted to uh, make the web programmable. So that is when, um, when the idea for JavaScript came up. And they hired a person called Brendan Eich to develop um, that language that allows the, the, the web to become programmable. Um, I make these dot dot dots because there were other sources for that, that inspired uh, JavaScript. And among them were, was the language self. So the object oriented uh, aspects of JavaScript come from a different source. And um, I'm making, I'm, I'm putting a big heart here uh, because uh, um, for, for a reason that you will very soon see. Okay, so that is a bit of a bit of the the background uh, here, and uh, I can go back to the slides. And uh, uh, basically, what what SICP then did is to take the most important ideas that uh, underlie the language scheme and make them universally accessible, make them such that uh, they that such that you don't need to. Um, uh, you don't need to worry about the programming language. You uh, learn the concepts that underlie the language. And uh, with that, you uh, pick up what is needed as a foundation for uh, computing. And the, the, this was enabled by Scheme's main design ideas. And that was minimalism. So they stripped away all the, the, uh, the large libraries of, uh, of Lisp and uh, made, it, made the language as small as possible. They followed rigorous design principles, whereas uh, Lisp was sort of a free for all, it sort of uh, accumulated features over the years, over the first decades of uh, computing. And uh, the notable features were uh, dynamic typing that was different from the mainstream languages at the time, uh, where you had uh, Algol. Uh, Algol uh, 68, you had Pascal as a result of the Algol effort. And, uh, and uh, uh, Lisp already deviated from that and basically provided an, um, a free uh, data format with uh, still uh, runtime typing. So that's the dynamic typing that underlied, underlies um, a Lisp a scheme. And a whole bunch of fam, a whole bunch of languages that are of widespread use today. So if you look at Python, Ruby, they're all of that of that family, and they all take their inspiration from Lisp. The, 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 the history goes all the way back to uh, the late 1950s or the early 1960s. It's pretty amazing to, that we are all basically um, steeped in that uh, computing history going all the way back then. And uh, lexical scoping. Well, the lexical scoping was an innovation over Lisp because Lisp had a very weird uh, dynamic scoping um, uh, scheme. And uh, that was, from a programming language design point of view, the most, um, the most critical, the most fundamental innovation of, of scheme compared to Lisp. And uh, the textbook SICP and scheme co-evolved. And uh, um, the language JavaScript um, 
if I go back to the, uh, to the uh, picture here, the language JavaScript was uh, basically commissioned by the, by the uh, company Netscape. And the idea was to, uh, that, that's how they hooked Brendan Eich. They, they told him, look, you know, uh, you, we know that you, love, that you love Scheme. We give you this chance to implement this language Scheme and make it available in the browser. But there's one uh, condition that we have. You need to make it look like Java. <laughs> right, so so take Scheme and uh, put whatever put whatever you want uh, in it from Scheme, the language that you love. But it, at the end of the day, it has to look like Java, and for commercial reasons, Java was the hot thing at the time, and they wanted that syntactic connection to Java. And um, uh, he also he he also was inspired by the language Self, so he took the object oriented aspects more or less from Self, and. Uh, today, uh, or the, they, they interviewed him later, and uh, uh, he admitted that uh, basically JavaScript is the quickie love child of Scheme and Self. Quickie love child of Scheme and Self. That's why I put the heart there in between. Uh, it's uh, not exactly love as you know it. Um, and it was done in a rush in an extreme rush. Uh, so that's why uh, JavaScript is syntactically unprincipled, semantically baroque, and uh, it's highly idiosyncratic because it uh, co-evolved along with all the web standards, uh, HTML, CSS, DOM, AJAX, and it had to accommodate all of those standards and uh, uh, in order to survive. And um, Yet, JavaScript became uh, one of the most widely used languages uh, that we have today. So if you look at the, the statistics on GitHub, um, uh, on, um, on Stack Overflow, uh, JavaScript is actually the most popular language, depending on the, uh, the measure that you take. The origins of JavaScript, uh, Netscape, commissioned the language from Brendan Eich. They hired Brendan Eich and uh, to, with the hook uh, develop scheme on the browser. It must look like Java. And he developed the prototype within 10 days. So that was in May, 1995. The first uh, version of JavaScript shipped in the Netscape Navigator uh, in November, 1995. So uh, because of the rush, the, the commercial, uh, pressure. Um, he couldn't uh, gather a team of, uh, of, of experts. He just did what he thought was right. And um, uh, he, as a result, got many things wrong. He made many mistakes. Uh, he himself admits that. Uh, everyone knows it. And, uh, and the JavaScript committees had to basically spend years to fix those mistakes. Because once such a mistake is made, um, it, uh, especially in a fast evolving system like, like the web, you cannot take it back anymore because people will make use of the features of the language that you provide to the uh, website developers. And they will rely on it. And that means your system needs to be backward compatible. You need to uh, keep the features or even the bugs you need to keep around, these bugs will become features because you have, no, um, you have no way to remove them. People rely on those uh, properties that will become features. Uh, but Ike also got a few things right. Because of this um, a scheme heritage, he knew scheme, um, he made sure that the language has first class functions right from the start, uh, lexically scoped, somehow lexically scoped, um, uh, and also dynamic typing. I call it strict dynamic typing, but um, basically the, the dynamic typing that, uh, that he inherited from, uh, from Lisp and from Scheme. Um, the type system that he developed 
uh, for this dynamic typing, uh, unfortunately, uh, were, were be, uh, ended up uh, quite baroque and hard to understand. So that was um, uh, as a result of this fast development. What he also got right was um, closures and lexical scoping in principle. However, the details um, are, are, are debatable. Um, there were quite severe initial flaws in his notion of lexical scoping. So he, he uh, um, allowed the scope of names declared with var to be uh, the entire function in which the declaration uh, occurs. And that was a severe design flaw that uh, only that was only fixed uh, in uh, 2015 with ECMAScript 6 when uh, let and uh, const were introduced into the language. So uh, Ike got some things right. He read SICP, don't know how well and how much, uh, but, but uh, it wasn't the worst thing that could have happened. He had the right, the right ingredients in place and uh, he did a job that allowed uh, people to continue from. And that was uh, basically what attracted me to JavaScript in uh, 2008, when I was thinking about uh, how to uh, go on from, uh, from SICP, how to improve SICP. And uh, that then uh, led me to ask the authors of SICP to uh, give me the sources of the textbook in 2008 and I started to trans, uh, first I converted the whole book to XML and then step-by-step step, uh, translated section by section in order to have something that I could share. And at the same time, uh, the School of Computing um, was, uh, had been using the SICP textbook already for uh, a number of years. So let me draw you the picture of that if I, um, if I have some time, um, so maybe it's a bit, maybe that would, uh, okay. So let me, let me share, let me share that story with you because we talked about, uh, I said that I want to cover the, um, the past, present and future of the source Academy. So what happened? Um, with the textbook. So when we look at the history of uh, the of the uh, education here, you have this MIT um, this MIT starting point that was in uh, 1984. That was SICP, and uh, the first edition uh, in 1984. Um, the MIT used this textbook in a course called 6001, uh, um, and they, uh, Abelson and Sussman came up with um, SICP edition two in 1996. So this was just a year after uh, JavaScript was invented. And uh, JavaScript wasn't on the horizon in education that much. So the second edition of SICP became a huge success and uh, became used around the world in, uh, in major computer science departments, including uh, NUS. So NUS uh, took this textbook and uh, basically um, uh, started to use it in a course that was initially called, this was 19, uh, 97. That was just a year before the School of Computing was started. And that was a course called IC1101S. Then in, 2000, uh, in uh, 1998, uh, the School of Computing renamed their courses to CS1101S. So that was uh, when uh, this whole thing started. And uh, in 2000, so this, this uh, continued all the way to 2000 and uh, 12, so I need to uh, maybe erase this a little bit. And 
what you need to know is that in the meantime, Scheme stopped using SICP. And that was in uh, 2004. They moved on to uh, Python or whatever, uh, whatever they decided to use. But uh, the book was used in uh, other places around the world. And uh, we continued with this effort, heroically continued. And uh, at some point, uh, Ben Leong took over the course and uh, started what uh, he called the uh, Jedi Academy. Jedi Academy. That was a gamified environment that allows you to use Scheme um, for your programming in, uh, in, the, in the school. And uh, it was uh, server-based, so that means you submit your program uh, and the, the programs will run on the server. Um, he did that until, to, until uh, 2011. So 2011, uh, Ben uh, moved on uh, with his, with his uh, teaching efforts regarding the freshmen and started to use Python. And uh, then that led then to what is called uh, the, the system that he then developed uh, at the MOE was called Coursemology. Coursemology. So that uh, uh, is this branch. Uh, I took over the course in, what was it, 2012. So this was 2012. Sorry about that. I took over the course in 2012 and uh, converted it to JavaScript. So that was a JavaScript effort. And uh, the rest is history. So then you have uh, the Source Academy, uh, Source Academy uh, 2, and uh, the versions Cadet, Knight, Rook that you can find on the, on the website. Let me show you that just uh, briefly. Um, you go to the Source Academy, you see that history uh, when you click on uh, the, the heart at the top you see uh, references to the original Source Academy that was built in 2016. The Source Academy 2, the, the original Source Academy was basically uh, a skin over this, uh, this Jedi Academy that Ben built. Uh, so there was uh, uh, that, that history. But then we built the Source Academy 2 in 2017 and uh, the cadet system in 2018. That was the starting point of the system that you all know. We have, uh, who has taken CS111S here? Okay, okay. So the system that you have been using uh, is uh, coming, is, is uh, uh, a descendant of the cadet system that was architected by Evan Sebastian in uh, 2018. And uh, since then, we have the versions uh, Knight and Rook uh, that was developed this year. And uh, Huawei is the uh, CTO of the, of the current uh, Source Academy. So Huawei is leading the team uh, that develops the current version. And so we had this um, effort this summer uh, as, an, as, an, uh, as the effort to make the Source Academy multi-tenant. And that was our major um, development this year. So that is a bit of a background uh, of the Source Academy. And uh, uh, back, to, um, back to the, um, the underlying motivations for using, uh, for using JavaScript in the context of SICP. So why did we decide to use JavaScript? So that was, uh, so, so you had already this uh, history, you had an established um, system and um, uh, material for using scheme following this textbook. What is, what, what led to this idea? Well, JavaScript is an important language. Uh, it is the core of the web, so we need to take it seriously. The idea was also to attract new audiences to 
uh, this, this way of thinking about programs. So uh, we shouldn't be stuck with uh, just people who are adventurous enough to use Scheme. We want to reach out with this material. The material itself is generic and doesn't need to be tied to a programming language. And because we can, because the uh, JavaScript was inspired by Scheme and shares enough features uh, with Scheme that this effort was possible. And then the question was how to adapt this textbook to JavaScript. And uh, what we did is we applied the, the principles that underlie Scheme to JavaScript. The underlying principles are minimalism. So what we needed to do is we needed to uh, strip down JavaScript to the bare minimal so that we could use it in a freshman course. You don't want to throw an 800 page specification or description uh, at freshmen uh, who need to wrap their minds around the most fundamental concepts. So uh, what we did is we, uh, we stripped down the language to a, to a language that's just small enough that is basically just scheme um, in JavaScript syntax. And we uh, went on to describe a uh, an series of sub-languages of JavaScript to make this possible. But the problem was how to avoid the, the ugly rest of JavaScript. And that is the challenge that, we, that I see. That's the main challenge that I see in uh, courses for freshmen. If you want to use, if you want to introduce uh, freshman computer scientists to uh, programming, you have this pressure that you want to use a language that is of common use because the students want to find internships in their second year and they want, to, they want to do something that they know is relevant in the industry. And the industry wants us to teach languages that are relevant to them. So there is that, that pressure zone that, we are, that we're in that we have to take seriously. And um, on the other hand, these languages become bigger and bigger. So how to... Be, remain relevant, how to uh, teach things that uh, people recognize uh, in the industry and that our students recognize and connect to. And at the same time, how to be able to focus on the fundamentals and not get, get distracted by the nitty gritty details of a real world programming language. That is the challenge. And the answer to that is the Source Academy because the Source Academy forces the students to use only a tiny subset of the language. So the, uh, some of you who took CS 111 S, uh, did you have prior programming experience? Did you know JavaScript? Anyone? Ja knew, knew JavaScript before, right? So how did it feel when you then enter the School of Computing, remember, the first couple of weeks uh, of taking this course too long ago. But I can imagine that some of you may have uh, felt frustrated, right? It's like, oh, now I, I, I want to use um, var, I want to use let, I want to uh, use loops. There is a reason for this. We want to uh, limit the students to only those concepts that meet our, our uh, pedagogical objectives. So we have the SSCP approach. We start from functional programming and um, uh, go through data structures and all the way to um, imperative concepts. And the languages that we, that we use follow that. That means we have a series of languages uh, each contained uh, in, the, in the next one uh, that follow the textbook um, structure. And that is the, the underlying feature of uh, the Source Academy. That worked not by design, uh, but by luck. Because the, the language JavaScript that we had in 2008 
uh, wasn't ready for this. It wasn't a modern programming language. It, was, it didn't have proper lexical scoping. It was uh, pretty much an ab abomination. I don't really remember what, what, what I saw in the language back then, but I was lucky because uh, after a few years, uh, torturing students with what we had at the time, uh, JavaScript changed. And ECMAScript 5, that was in 2014, ECMAScript uh, 2015 uh, added uh, the strict mode, added uh, constant let and lambda expressions. All of a sudden, it became seriously possible to translate not just bits and pieces, but the entire textbook and use it just in the way it was used back in the uh, 1990s. But not just, not only that, we had the huge uh, uh, resources of the web available to us. That means we could inspire the students with, with graphics, with sound processing, with, uh, uh, we could integrate everything in, an, in a, in a browser-based environment that, of, uh, that made it unnecessary to download any software. So um, basically we struck, we struck luck and the main people to credit for this are the, uh, the teams that underlie, that, that, that drove this effort of standardization and of modernizing JavaScript and uh, introduce these concepts. And those were Pratap, uh, Pratap uh, Lakshman and in particular, Alan Wirfs Brock, uh, who led the ECMAScript 2015 standardization effort. So that uh, made it all possible. And uh, if you look at the Source Academy as a programming language implementation, uh, what you see is then uh, is a, an, a web front end that the uh, that the Avenger team developed um, uh, in the uh, Cadet version. Uh, that was uh, Evan Sebastian's architecture to use React on the front end, to use Elixir on the back end, and. Uh, eventually, we, the, we then went in the um, in this second year of Cadet uh, to the cloud and AWS to scale this whole thing. And today, the system can very easily handle uh, hundreds of students. And this year, we um, we we are we're preparing for uh, going worldwide with this system because next year our SS, our SICP JS textbook will be published by MIT Press, and we're going to have a worldwide audience. And that means we need to uh, uh, offer something to the, to the professors who pick up this, uh, this textbook. And we made the system multi-tenant. That means you can just log in and create your own course, uh, register your own students, um, and uh, uh, using, use, using basically the uh, NUS deployment of the Source Academy. At the same time, we have a public version that doesn't even have a backend. Uh, so, so it's basically a free for an, an, uh, a single uh, single page application that uh, you that uh, you can uh, connect to your GitHub or or to your um, Google Drive uh, to do to do your work. And that also has the textbook. Uh, uh, integrated into it. So that's um, the current state. And the, uh, from a programming language implementation point of view, um, we isolated the different components into, um, into um, independent entities. In particular, the language implementation uh, is pluggable. So the language uh, that we currently use, the source languages can be easily replaced by other languages uh, just by plugging in a different language implementation. At the moment, JS Lang is implementing uh, JavaScript or so our source languages, uh, but you can um, deploy other languages quite easily using the system. Um, we are um, we have an, a whole family of programming language implementations built into the system. Our main implementation for JavaScript 
in the Source Academy is a transpiler that translates source to JavaScript. Source is a sub-language of JavaScript. That may be a bit weird for you to, to imagine. Well, why do we want to do that? Why do you want to uh, write a compiler that translates from a language to the same language or from a sub-language to the same language? The reason for that is that we want to, um, we want to adhere to the JavaScript standard. JavaScript um, requires uh, proper tail calls. So, uh, and uh, unfortunately, um, I mean, the, the proper tail calls are an, a core uh, ingredients of the textbook. SICP um, makes a big deal out of proper tail calls for a good reason. Um, but unfortunately, the existing implementations of uh, the browsers don't adhere to the JavaScript standard that requires proper tail calls. So um, we uh, translate the source language into JavaScript such that this feature of proper tail calls is guaranteed even when the underlying programming environment, the underlying browser, does not adhere to the proper tail call standard. So that's uh, the reason that's the main reason why we um, don't run our source programs directly on the browser, which we could, because source is a sub language of JavaScript, and but instead um, compile the language in the browser on the fly into uh, into another version uh, of JavaScript. Um, uh, we also have other implementations uh, for uh, various tools. For you, you're probably familiar with this um, environment model visualizer. For that, we use an interpreter, and um, how we developed a uh, virtual machine for uh, the uh, for uh, running source, and we use that for our Lego Mindstorms. Um, uh, component of the course that you are from, that some of you are familiar with. Uh, we have various language extensions that uh, are also uh, developed in this uh, JS slang uh, implementation effort. All right, we also have an experimental compiler to WebAssembly, and that's our fastest implementation at the moment. Uh, so we uh, can translate uh, source um, on the fly to WebAssembly and run it in the browser. And that gives us a speed up of, um, oh, what is it, another 20, factor of 20 or something like that. Um, I don't have the time to take you through all the tools that we developed for the system, uh, but as a teaching environment, it has grown to become uh, quite interesting. And we hope to uh, offer this to the world uh, next year when, uh, when the uh, textbook uh, hits, the, uh, book hits the bookstores. And um, uh, I want to spend the last few minutes on the uh, challenges that we faced uh, translating the textbook from Scheme to JavaScript. So what were the technical issues here? The first one is homoiconicity. Scheme uh, inherited, from in inherited from Lisp the idea that programs are written as data structures. So what you write as a programmer is, um, a, is, an, is a syntax that directly corresponds to a data structure in the language. So if you, you, know, you, you've, uh, if you have taken a programming language course or you if you've taken CS101 and S, you've seen our MetaCircle evaluator, think of the syntax tree of the language. Of, of, a, of a program to be what, what you're writing. You basically write a version of the syntax tree. So the data and the programs become more or less the same, more or less indistinguishable. And that is called homoiconicity. And when you have that, um, it becomes quite, uh, it becomes very easy to uh, write meta circle evaluators. And we had to fight with that. 
Um, we also had to deal with uh, differences in scope, in scoping rules, and we had to deal with the statement-oriented syntax and return statements. From Iconicity, Scheme has the quotes that allows you to, um, to take a, a piece of program and turn it into a data structure. JavaScript doesn't have this. JavaScript has an elaborate syntax like all other mo modern programming languages. And that meant that we had to add something to the textbook. We had to explicitly introduce parsing of programs. So this parse function that you see in our current uh, CS 101 s in chapter four uh, in uh, SICP uh, is, new, is a new addition in SICP JS. It doesn't, it's not needed in the SICP because of the homoiconicity of uh, scheme. Um, I don't see that as a disadvantage. I see it actually as an advantage because um, the syntax that you have in today's languages is an, a fact. We don't want to run away from that. We want to admit that programming programs should have a proper syntax. They should be readable. So if you want to do meta programming, if you want to write programs that deal with other programs, the parsing of programs is a necessary step that you don't want to avoid. So we introduced that in the, in the textbook in chapter four, and it wasn't actually very hard to do. We added the syntax processing, the parsing in section 4.1.2 as part of um, the description of the, of the, compo of the uh, syntactic components of the language. The second step, Sorry. Mm -hmm. I think I need to find the back button. Okay. The second step was the scope. Um, now, as a scheme, has this notion of uh, defining names. And uh, uh, it's quite heavily used in the textbook. It's basically adding names on the fly to your environment. Uh, JavaScript doesn't have this. JavaScript in that respect is cleaner than Scheme. Uh, so we uh, went, we, we had an opportunity to clean up uh, SICP in that respect and uh, uh, deal with uh, properly scoped names. And that, if, uh, that involves uh, scanning out names um, uh, in every block that you are entering and declare them at the beginning of the block. So that is basically an, a cleaner version of scoping. And I was quite pleased uh, to, uh, to uh, rigorously enforce this uh, throughout the textbook, including um, all sections of chapter four and chapter five. Uh, so that was an, uh, and the, the final uh, difficulty that we uh, faced was the uh, statement oriented syntax. Again, statements are uh, common in most programming languages. Um, you have an, an, uh, a small community, the functional programming community that um, designed uh, languages to be expression oriented you know the difference for, as a programmer between statements and expressions. And um, scheme is expression oriented. And that means uh, there is no need to discuss return statements. And um, the language is designed such that the uh, that functions, when you call a function, the uh, result of evaluating the expression that is the body of the function is the return value of the function. That's not the case in, in statement-oriented languages where you can have return statements nested inside of the body of a, of a function. So you can have deep inside, for example, a for loop, you can have a return statement. You can return from the function, abandon the context that you're in, abandon all the environments that you have built in that context, and just return from the function. So that's an important concept 
uh, in today's programming languages. And again, we were able to modernize this textbook and cover this important concept uh, now in the, um, in the context of JavaScript where you, we had to uh, in order to uh, describe a reasonable sublanguage of the, of the language. And that led to various, uh, due to various changes in uh, the later parts of the textbook. So that should give you a little bit of an idea of what it took to translate this material from, um, uh, from Scheme to JavaScript and modernize it and add uh, features that are uh, relevant in today's uh, world of computing. Thank you, that's it for, uh, for today. That's all I have. And um, I think I would be uh, able to take some, some of your questions. Anyone has any questions? Feel free to ask now. Uh, evening prof. So uh, I was wondering, uh, because I've noticed on most of the other introduction to programming courses outside, for example, like even by SMU or online, like perhaps the, uh, I think it's like data care, I think for most other ways of these courses, right? They usually begin with things like flow control, if blocks and for loops, right? But I've noticed that in CS1101, that's not the case. Yes. So like, what's the advantage for doing it this way eh? and especially focusing more on recursion? Yes. Um, see, I feel that this is, the, this is the most distinguishing feature of the SICP textbook. And I feel very strongly that SICP gets that right. Let me explain why I think that. When you uh, study... Uh, science mathematics in high school or in junior college, you have a mental model of what happens when complex formal structures get processed. You are yourself a processor of complex formal structures. If you do an equation, you solve an equation, you look at the equation or you, you, or you simplify an, a formula, even in primary school. You are given an, uh, an uh, uh, you're given a, an arithmetic arithmetic expression. You know how to do it. You know how to evaluate it. You look for places where you can simplify, and you do that simplification. You replace uh, one plus two inside your formula by the number three. That replacement uh, is the core of functional programming. It is basically how we think of, um, of, a, of an, um, a declarative expression to be evaluated. So the, um, so we start with a language in which you only have what you know already in high school. You have functions. You know what a function is. A function is a description of, uh, a function is basically uh, takes an input or takes a number of inputs and computes an output. Well, the, um, in mathematics, you don't really need to worry that much about how that computation happens. And in computer science, we take a closer look and say, okay, let us, uh, let us analyze what are the computation steps here? But in principle, what we're doing when we are starting with functional programming is we're just connecting to what the students already know, which is a declarative framework. There is no, uh, there's no assignment uh, in mathematics. There's no need to talk about assignment when you want to uh, uh, get the students a first access into what computation is about. Uh, so, so I feel that that's the right approach uh, to connect, especially today, where most of our students don't have any prior uh, programming background. That means we can directly connect to what they know already from high school. They know uh, equation solving. They have no. They know, for example, they know uh, 
uh, some aspects of higher mathematics, they, they know differentiation, integration. These are functional approaches, basically. The, and uh, the differentiation uh, operation takes a function and gives you a function. So it's very easy to, uh, to connect uh, to that sort of mathematical background. And that is why we, uh, uh, that's why we uh, still enjoy SICP. Yes, Ilya. Okay. So, uh, in your uh, large experience running this class, what was? Oh, thank you. So, in your large experience running this class, what was the biggest surprise, pleasant or unpleasant, uh, with regard to how you thought things should work and how they really worked? So, uh, something that you envisioned in one way, but like through the experience with the students, you saw that oh, this is not how it should be done. Like they are not getting it, or like this is just wrong. And so, and you had to change it. Or was it just like all working as you designed it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, um, I, I, I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants here. Uh, what is what uh, SICP, uh, that there's, a, there's a, a tradition going back into the 1980s. Uh, they figured out what works and what doesn't work. And we, in the School of, School of Computing, we basically took uh, the, the second edition of SICP and ran with it. So there was a foundation that was already laid by my colleagues, uh, including Ben, who then uh, uh, added this, uh, this uh, gamification component uh, to it. And, um, and so, so there wasn't that much surprising from a didactic point of view. Um, what I found important uh, over the years was to uh, was the importance of the textbook and I didn't realize that in the beginning so I I uh, translated bits and pieces and uh, and benefited from it but that it's important to go all the way I think that is what I discovered along the way that you need to um, in order to run a large class you need to get everyone on the same page you need to establish a way to talk about programs and that i think can be ideally done with a proper textbook so uh, you read the textbook and the language the, the the way to talk about things gets established that i discovered only over the years Yeah, I'll be reading out. So Ansel Lin asked, like, so originally he was introduced to programming through Python and R, and he learned JavaScript for web frameworks. But he has never read SICP in detail because it's intimidating. But now he feels inspired to read SICP. So he likes to ask, what are some of the key concepts from SICP that you think intermediate to experienced programmers should get from SICP? And the second question from him is, and would you recommend someone who already knows JavaScript to read the Lisp version of SICP or to read the JS version of SICP? <laughs> um, I think uh, this is my, my, my totally unbiased opinion. I think that um, the scheme version is uh, after the SICP JS will come out, the scheme version will be only of historical interest. It will be of interest to people who are interested in the Lisp uh, heritage. Uh, because we managed to translate the entire book, uh, all the concepts are now a lot more accessible, accessible in, an, in a common syntax, in a syntax that, are, that is modern and that is uh, readable. Um, so I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't recommend people to go back to the uh, scheme version because we have the, the JavaScript version. So if you're familiar with a modern block structured programming language, you are much better off. But what are the main ingredients of SICP that, uh, that would uh, lead an uh, experienced programmers, programmer to go back to that textbook and read SICP JS? Um, I think uh, you can get lost in the details of a large programming language. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, this what 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 are objects? 
why do we need objects? What, bring ob what do objects bring you in a language? It's a bit hard to distinguish the benefits of object-oriented programming from the underlying computational framework. Because in JavaScript, it's all mixed up into one. And most, um, and as soon as, whatever you do in JavaScript, you're going to use objects. One distinguishing feature of our book is there are no objects whatsoever. Our SSCP.js textbook uses a sub-language of JavaScript that does completely without objects. And I think that's something interesting for, for today's programmers because you get to see the fundamental computational setup without distraction of, um, uh, without the distraction of, of the useful stuff, the stuff, the object on the program that we need in everyday work. So fu functions are much more, are more fundamental. Uh, lexical scoping is much more fundamental. Data structures are much more fundamental than objects. And what we use in SICP and SICPGS are the most, the most simplistic data structure you can think of. And that's a pair. And that is the Lisp heritage. So uh, if you come from an, uh, if you go, come to SICP as a programmer, you, I think, get reminded of what is important and what is not important. That's a long answer to the short question. Thank you. So we have one final question from Azim. So he asked, why teach MC over types in CS1101S? Why teach what? MC. Oh, why teach the matter circular evaluator as opposed to, or? Types. As opposed to types, ah, so, okay, okay, okay. So, we, so the, the premise is that we have uh, some time left at the end of the semester. And what you could do is you could do this, this or that. And we uh, choose to uh, spend some time on uh, what we call the meta circular evaluator, as opposed to introducing students to other things, uh, other useful things like, uh, like types, right? Okay. Um, see, I think this meta circle evaluator closes a circle. We're starting with uh, the with an, a, a very simplistic, very high level mental model that connects students to their high school years. That's the substitution model. We graduate to the environment model that gives us a good idea of how the scoping rules of the language translate to the runtime of to, to the running program. And that environment model you hopefully stays with you for the rest of your career in the, in the school of computing. But it remains an, uh, it remains an, an uh, uh, informal concept. It remains pictures that we draw on, an, on a piece of paper. What the meta circle evaluator does is that it grounds this mental model in a sense that we're actually programming this environment model as a real program. That's the meta circular evaluator. So it is an implementation of the mental model that the students have already. And I think that's, that uh, can be an eye opener for the students. They understand the concepts deeper they understand the environment model in a deeper way, and they get an example for a real programming language processor, which is important. You need to be able, you need to see that we can invent new programming languages. When you have a new application and you get stuck, you have the freedom to come up with a new language that solves some problems for you. And this, uh, this idea that we are just Inventing a new language and implement them on the fly as part of our, uh, as part of what we do as pro, as uh, computer scientists, I think that's much more fundamental than uh, introducing students to object-oriented programming or types that they already that they see next semester anyway. So, so I think uh, uh, I use that opportunity to open up their minds because programming language implementations are embedded in most software systems. If you look at uh, your browsers, of course, 
uh, but any any uh, complex system you look at the uh, microsoft uh, suite of applications any complex system is going to have interpreters and uh, and programming language processors inside of it uh, so so we need to introduce our students to those uh, fundamental concepts yeah. yeah thank you prof martin All let's right. have a round of applause to prof Next, we will have a short intermission and we'll, we will welcome another prof soon. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, you can feel free to quickly use the washroom. So, uh, Prof. Sergey will now be giving a talk. So, we'll just be setting up quickly and then starting. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, I have to go because I have an uh, extracurricular activity. Oh, so, um, yeah, guys, so uh, what activity that I need to go to? So, uh, what the thing mentioned just now is uh, so we need to do a sort of attendance QR code thing for um, this physical session. So, we'll flash the QR code on the screen for a minute or so, and then you guys just scan it.
Ah, okay, I have this talent, right? Break things, should really have worked on testing. I'm working oh, on yeah. verification. Yeah. yeah, so hello everyone. Now we are going to welcome our second speaker, Prof. Ilya. Let's welcome him. Good evening. Wow, you guys are really our motivated bunch. To stay here until 8 p.m. on Friday, that's, that's the dedication. So I'll try to make it worth your while. Uh, short disclaimer, I've given, I've, before coming here, I've given a three hours lecture on concurrent programming. So if at some point I start speaking gibberish, that's because of that. So please let me know and better interrupt me with some clever remark or a question. And also since everyone is sleepy here, so like make sure to ask anything that comes to your mind so we will just make it more fun. So, all right. Oh, it's difficult to follow Martin's talk. It's pretty big shoes to fill. So uh, I'm going to talk about something rather non-technical. I hope it's within the spirit of this meeting. I've never been at Friday Hugs before, so you let me know how am I doing and if you'd like me to uh, skip or clarify something. My name is Ilya. I'm an associate professor at the School of Computing, and I was about to make a dramatic click, and obviously it didn't work. So let me try to make it again. Nope, 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 okay. All right, so this is me. Uh, uh, until, uh, until a couple of years from now, I still have a joint appointment with Yale and US College. You probably all know the news. Otherwise, I'm teaching classes here and I'm teaching classes at the college. And I also serve as a programming language uh, expert at Zilliqa, which is a Singapore founded uh, blockchain startup where I'm working on programming language design and implementation. And before I've been uh, affiliated with a number of places, specifically, I was a professor at University College London. I was working in MDS Software Institute in Madrid. And I also, for quite a number of years, I was a software engineer at JetBrains, the company that some of you might know and use its products. So my research is in design and implementation of programming languages, also more uh, modern topics such as program repair, synthesis, and design of programming languages, specifically in an application to concurrent and distributed systems. And this is something that I'm teaching at the college at here and here at the School of Computing. Uh, some of you actually might have used the code bases that I have contributed to. So those of you who have ever run a Haskell compiler, here is my code there. So I wrote a part of the static analysis. Some of you who might have heard of Facebook uh, Racer D or more broadly infer suite of analysis. That's also something that I've contributed to. And if you have ever used Scala plugin for IntelliJ IDEA, well, this is the thing that I've started. I'm no longer contributing there. So there is a pretty large team, but you can see uh, who made the first commit. All right, so I'm a functional programmer. I'm writing most of my code in the languages such as Scala, uh, Haskell, Okamo, Cockproof Assistant, which doesn't really have an official logo. So this is just the logo that I'm using because it's a mechanized proof assistant and it's a mechanical rooster. And also Scylla, which is a small programming language in which 
we write smart contracts in Zilliqa, and that's also the language that I have started and which is currently in active development and uh, actively used for developing DeFi applications. I will be happy to talk about that at another Friday Hacks meeting. So today I'm going to talk about something rather fun and not really related to my research or and most of my teaching, something that I've been doing for quite a number of years, first at University College London, and then when I joined here at NUS. So uh, the main topic is going to be how to take fun problems we get from computational geometry and optimizations and turn them into programming competitions. All right. So uh, how did it start? So it all started from an idea of uh, making sort of lightweight programming competitions, which should be fun, a part of a certain class that I've been teaching at UCL. So that's what UCL campus at central London, that's BBC Tower there. That's what it looks like. Uh, I had an office with a spectacular view to a brick wall. That's where I was spending most of my work days. Now I have a slightly better view here. And uh, at some point, my director of study came and asked me, would you like, would I like to run what we called scenario project? I had no idea what is that, but I said yes, because that's what assistant professors do. So, and the requirements for this project were as follows, something that actually might look familiar to you from some of the projects that you have taken here at School of Computing. So that was targeting sophomores, and that was supposed to be a project that takes the whole week and fosters the teamwork, collaboration, and also parallelization of tasks. Uh, and since, well, sophomores, they know quite a bit of math and also a little bit of programming, but nothing particularly advanced in terms of technologies and framework. And so that should involve some math and also some programming. And it should be uh, challenging for the students, but relatively easy to assess because the scale was massive. So we had the class of uh, 200 students uh, taking that. So back then I was a big fan of this book. So, and I'm still am. So, you know, it's really, really great to have a field of computer science that has the book. So you just take this book, you read, uh, you read it and you realize, oh, I want to do that. Or hell no, I'm not going to do that. But if you want to get into computational geometry, this is the book that you want to read. So uh, this book is actually quite spectacular. So it has a number of chapters. Each one is about particular family of geometric algorithms and it comes with motivation. For example, well, when we talk about polygon triangulation, it's not really about just boring polygons, it's about guarding an art gallery from the thieves. And when it talks about something like a uh, Voronoi diagram, some of you probably know what is it, it's a pretty famous thing. That's about navigating between post offices and finding the closest one to your location. So see, very much grounded in reality. And this is exactly what I was looking for. And I very actively exploited the knowledge from this book to run these three scenario weeks uh, over the course of a number of years. So those are the three years I've spent at UCL. And um, I ran the three competition each year based on a different problem. So let me tell you briefly about one, which started it all. And this is based on so-called art gallery problem. Who knows what art gallery problem is about? Seriously? Okay, at least I'll tell you something new today. So art gallery problem is actually a pretty old problem uh, coined by, I think, Czech mathematician Václav Chvatal in 1975. That's, that's much older than me. So here's a problem. You have an art gallery with precious pieces of art. You want to guard them. And what you want to do, you want to place guards or rather security cameras uh, in this gallery. So it all would be ob um, observed by these cameras or the guards. So, okay, in 1975, there were not that many security cameras. So let's talk guards, this old fellows who really don't want, like to move that much, but he doesn't mind to look around. So we put one in the corner put one there. Well, is it enough to see the whole gallery? Mm, I'm not sure. Okay, so we can put a few more. All right, uh, the question is, how many guards we really need to guard the gallery if we know that each guard can see all the space around himself, but he or she cannot see through the walls? Okay, that's the problem. And the answer really depends on the size of the gallery. And the gallery is just a two-dimensional polygon. Uh, possibly with obstacles. So if we have a convex polygon like this one, then clearly we just need one guard. If we have something like that, okay, someone pick a guess, how many guards do we need? Sorry? Four. Uh, four probably will do that. Uh, any other ideas how, I mean, because if, like we need to pay to all of them. So we obviously want to minimize this number. Uh, 
Huh? Okay, fine. Uh, okay, the answer I have is uh, close. It's three. So we pick three guards and we put one there. So that's as far as he can see. And we put another guy here. And we put another guy here. This is actually pretty interesting adversarial problem to design, like given a number of uh, vertices you can have in your polygon, design the one which is absolutely worst in terms of how many guards it will require to, uh, to guard it. it. Actually, and that solution exists. Okay, but this is an optimization problem. And, for, and, and, and it's stated as follows. For a given gallery, or which is described as a polygon, to find the minimal set of guards and also their positions where we should locate them. So together they can guard the entire, uh, the entire interior of, uh, of the gallery. So far so good? Obviously it's an anti-hard problem. Like otherwise that would be no fun, right? And when we see an NP-hard problem, we usually start complaining because that just doesn't make sense to solve. But luckily, this is a problem for which we not necessarily want to have the optimal solution. We want just to have a solution. And now you see where I'm going with it. Because if we just want to have a solution, we might have some solutions that are better and some that are worse. So, and that is the subject of the competition. So how about we make it into uh, something that, uh, would be fun to compete over. So find the best solutions for a collection of very large polygons. So here is one polygon whose shape you can recognize. Can you? Oh boy. Well, okay. You know, what's said in my profession that every year I'm getting progressively like fewer correct answers to this question. <laughs> That's Enterprise from Star Trek. Okay. I will, I will, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, somebody tell me what should I insert for like for something that would be recognizable nowadays. Okay, so um, anyway, so now imagine that you want to, uh, like you want to build this competition from scratch and you're an organizer. So what do you want to prepare? Uh, first of all, you want to have a generator for uh, large problems. I mean, this enterprise, I mean, I essentially do it by hand, uh, convert it into SVG, parse it and convert it to the, to the list of coordinates. But ideally you want to have something that push the button. So you want to procedurally generate the polygons. You also want to have a solution checker with the feedback. So which requires a number of geometric machinery and the web server. So that's something that I had to write and well, also make sure that it all works. So let me just quickly tell you about a bunch of things that I think are fun. And that's something that I've been reusing a lot since that particular competition. And something that you also might be interested in looking at should you come to a similar problem. So problem one. Uh, imagine that we don't want to design those um, polygons, those galleries by hand. How do we generate them automatically? So there is unfortunately no one here from Yale and US where I've been teaching data structures for uh, three years. And one thing that all my students know is how to generate really, 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 really large randomized uh, test, uh, test data. List, arrays, trees, graphs, you name it. Like, okay, it, like I just don't accept uh, assignments un unless they are tested on randomly generated uh, big data. But this is a tricky one. So we want to generate interesting polygons. So naturally I went on and online and looked like how, how geometry specialists generate polygons. In turn though, there is like no uniformity. There is no framework I could use just to generate polygons. So I decided to do something like more or less in the style of functional programming. Like, you know, in functional programming, you can grow a list by appending head to the list and, and more and more, and you can grow a tree. How, you, how do you grow a polygon? Well, you need to do it inductively. You start from primitive building blocks, like these four bricks. And then you can start, and you can think of a scenario to connect them together. So you can take this one, that's going to be the seed. And then uh, you can take uh, others, you can find segments on the surface that you can attach them to and kind of randomly turn, rescale and attach. And eventually, and then you start growing your polygon sort of like a cactus. Uh, and it grows like this, like this and this. I mean, like obviously you probably won't get anything particularly insightful. For example, here I'm only looking for rectilinear polygons, but that also largely depends on what exactly are your primitives. Like if your primitives are like looking like morning stars or they look like, uh, like sickles, uh, that will also make it to the shape. Okay, and that was actually very simple framework which turned out to be surprisingly efficient. So uh, now we can enumerate primitive polygons and plug an arbitrary and make an arbitrary generator from them. 
like okay, those of you who had pleasure to generate like random stuff, you know what I'm talking about. Actually, pretty big problem in programming language is how to randomly generate programs, but that's not what this talk is about. By the way, there are some questions in the chat, or not, these are not the questions, these are just something. Anyway, those of you who had experience with Haskell might have heard of this fantastic framework called Quick Check. So Quick Check is a library of uh, higher order functions that we essentially provide with someone know uh, that you provide with the definition of the data type and it generates arbitrary large instances of this data type for you. So what I did, I developed a library which kind of plugs into quick check, but uh, not in Haskell, but in Scala, and it generates arbitrarily large polygons. So there is this polygon combinator that uh, attaches together and there's this algorithm and well, now I can generate things like this or like this or like this. Yeah, enjoy. Anyway, so now I have this, I can populate the competition. So, uh, but how do I make sure that my tester that uh, takes the solution and solution are just the positions of guards for the polygon. How does it, uh, how do I make sure that it's all correct? And the problem is like testing solutions for art gallery problem, it's actually not particularly trivial. And it relies on a quite intricate algorithm that checks the visibility fields. Remember when we put the guard, like it's visibility field sort of like went by an angle as it was cut by a corner of the room. So how do we compute this visibility field? So, okay, so I dug into literature. There was an algorithm which was as old as me and it was written in a very, very uh, Baroque pseudocode. So I implemented on Scala, obviously it didn't work. Okay, so then I had to write uh, a test framework. So which I luckily already had. And uh, yeah, so this is the algorithm. Now you know how old I am. So uh, the problem is when I implemented it like this and I tried to test it on uh, random instances of polygons, I started to see like really, really weird phenomena so this is a polygon which has a guard or a camera in every corner and you can see that some of the visibility fields they go through the walls well it's absolutely not fun to debug anything like geometric algorithms on a large shape so this one has 260 vertices you i really really don't want to debug on that how do i get to that well and here comes the other great idea of uh, property like of this random mass test testing which builds your data structures inductively if you know how to grow them you should also know how to shrink them. And remember, we're growing these polygons like, cact like cacti, cactuses. And now if we try to sort of convert this process, then we can uh, reverse the testing. So, uh, and this is what I've tried to do. Uh, I think my presentation froze again. Yes, so how do we shrink the polygon? So what we essentially do, we need to, like when we, like when we create this polygon, we just need to maintain a little bit more structure than just the shape of it. Specifically, we need to maintain the order in which we attached all these polygons. So like, the seed went first, and then there was the second guy, and the third, and the fourth, and et cetera. So now, if we see which polygons required which ones in order to be attached and form a contiguous shape, that relation will form a tree. We could not build the whole polygon without the first one, but we only needed to attach the second one in order to attach the fourth and then the fifth one. So that's the tree relation. The cool fact, if you traverse a subtree of any of this tree, you will get a topological sub polygon of the original polygon. Like for example, if you have this one, you will get this polygon. And if you get this one, you will get this polygon. And this is brilliant because now I can enumerate all the traversals of this tree and get all the sub polygons with very, very similar features to my original one. And hopefully they will be helpful when you're producing the same bugs. This is exactly what I've done. So I've taken like the process of generating this polygon, applied the approach and managed to shrink it to this. one. And this one also was sufficient to reproduce the bug. And this is actually something that, okay, if you remember nothing else, this is how property-based randomized testing works. And the keyword you want to Google for is called quick check. So this is the library in which you generate, you create your generators. And also it provides a lot of help and sometimes does it automatically for you. It can generate shrinkers for you. So if you tell it how to generate big data types, it will tell you how to, how to shrink them into smaller instances. And this is super useful because sometimes the bug is detected using the uh, large instance, but you really want to have a small one in order to debug your program. So this is like the insight that comes from programming language community, but we applied it to geometry. And in fact, found the bug and this algorithm, which is as old as me. Okay, so all that came from organizing this competition. Uh, the actually the amount of code I don't really, I really don't like to write a lot of code. So the, the amount of code was pretty small, so all written in Scala. So and then we had this competition. We had thirty very large polygons, and it was exactly one week, one hundred hours to accomplish. 
Uh, and let's see what were the surprises. So that first year, there were not that many students taking part. There were only 94 participants, 24 teams. I had my own server and most of the solutions just applied some textbook algorithm with optimization. So the nice thing about textbook algorithm for solving art gallery problem, it's very robust and it gives you non-optimal, but very easy to obtain solutions. But if you want to get something more advanced, something close to the optimum, then well, knock yourself up. Machine learning, genetic optimization. So, okay, whoever knew something of that, uh, they tried to apply that. It was actually very interesting to see, uh, to organize this thing from within to see the submission patterns. Okay, I'm not very good in, with GNU plot, but this is what's happening here. So bottom up, there are hours of the week and we had 30 problems. And uh, this is how many problems were submitted, uh, essentially each hour. So, and you can see that this is a team that started from submitting a few and then more and more and more and like towards the top it saturates and eventually they just didn't solve one problem which is this vertical pixel line. So this is a fairly normal progression. You know, data visualization is amazing. Okay, and then you can visualize other patterns of how people work. Like for example, we have these experimentators who get a full solution. So that's a, but they don't like the quality of the solution. It's not optimal. So they take it down and then they resubmit in a few hours something that is better. Or they do it one problem by one as these guys in the middle. I think it's, it's rather cool. Okay, so we, okay, my TAs and me, so we call them experimentators. Okay, so there are also these ones, uh, which I call hard workers. What do you think is specific about this, uh, uh, about these particular teams? How did they solve the problems? I wish. Well, they were solving them by hand. How do I know that? Because if you have an algorithm, you fit all your problems to it and typically it solves most of those. And you have this nice horizontal line in the submission like you have here. But when you have a team of four really hard working students who really don't want to write the code and you have a problem that appeals to geometry, then uh, you get something like here on the left where each problem is submitted one by one and gradually uh, it saturates. So yeah which is actually quite fun. Okay, so uh, these are my favorite. So especially like this uh, team on the left that did a couple of trial trials and tested something, then like went dark and then submitted the full solution, never submitted anything again. And that was the team that won. So <laughs> basically they didn't try to use the server as an Oracle. They didn't try like to probe and hack it. They just like tested it very briefly and then pff, and then came up with a solution. So they actually found some published uh, paper that had a uh, reduction of the art gallery problem to the set coverage problem. So they implemented this reduction and they hit it with some set partition algorithm. I think it was really cool. Okay, something that started late. Okay, this is a really cool one. So this team had two members and they really didn't want to talk to each other. And they basically worked on uh, two halves of the problem set in parallel and they didn't merge. So first one submitted and then another submitted and then the first submitted again. And finally they, they merged the solutions and submitted that all together. All right, I have more stories like this to tell. Okay, guess what is this? What is this plot? That's the intensity of the submissions. It goes top, bottom up and at the last we have the last hour before the deadline. So each bubble is one hour, how many submissions it had. What I find absolutely remarkable is the fact that this is midnight. This is 1 a.m., two, three, four. And this was the, the last night before the deadline. Oh boy, okay. Anyway, fun stuff. So that was this competition. Uh, had a lot of success, so I uh, got really, really good evaluation for that one. I ran it for two more years with two different problems. I don't, I'm not planning to talk about them today, but this is sort of to give the motivation to give the setup and the mindset in which I approached a much larger challenge, which is taking this idea and scaling it to the community of seasoned, seasoned hackers uh, in, uh, in, the programming language, um, in the programming language community. So, uh, okay, I'm feeling compelled to have like a, half a minute break and 
let you ask some questions before I proceed. How did I do something for like what was the what was the outcome? Yes, please. If there are any what? Unit test cases. Hidden test cases. No, there were no hidden test cases. So that was the thing. And uh, thank you for asking. So I probably should make it specific what exactly was the setup. The students could use any programming language. The only they I was asking them to submit their code, but only for my own curiosity, just to see what kind of code they have written. That was not graded, that was not assessed. The only thing that was assessed are the text files with their solutions. And uh, with this regard, they were completely open to any technology that would help them to solve this problem. Why don't what? I'm not sure what exactly you are suggesting and what would be a... Yeah. Uh, like you have this quick chat checker, right? Uh-huh. So uh, why not you let them submit the code and then you run your quick chat checker? Okay, why am I not submitting the code and running it through my randomized test suite? Great question. So uh, whenever you organize competitions that involve coding, you always have like pretty much two big classes of possibilities. One class of possibility, making it agnostic to the programming language and let just assess the data, which is what I did, or uh, require them to submit, or require the participants to submit the code and run the code and assess the quality of the solutions on some un like previously unspecified input that the code produces. So the second one obviously seems like more rigorous and more principal thing to do, except you realize that, well, students are really smart and you really want to invest into sandboxing to run in this code. Like uh, those of you who have, okay, none of you, who have taken compilers class with me, but I will be probably teaching the very same class at School of Computing next year, it's a 4,000 level. Uh, you will see the automatic uh, test suite that we have for our uh, test and the compilers. And we spend an immense amount of time into developing the sandbox so it would sanitize the input because obviously the first thing the students will do is try to display the hidden tests uh, by means of pretty, pretty printing, uh, pretty printing and uh, the, the content of those in their code. And well, I can only, I mean, okay, I'm not the best hacker in the world. I'm, I'm very limited in my security mindset. So I can only imagine what happens if I just run some unverified code in my environment without proper sandbox. Right, uh, you can compile it to web assembly, which is sandbox, and then just show like the first few bytes of the. Well, okay, great point. First of all, that was 2016. Web assembly came out in 2017. Second, uh, we are certainly approaching the era when literally everything compiles down to uh, WebAssembly, but we are not quite yet there. And indeed, the point of that was not really limit the students in the choice of their framework. So I've had maybe half of the solutions were written in Python, quarter in JavaScript, and the rest was some mix of Haskell, uh, C++, Java, uh, and other more esoteric languages. So I either might have asked them to compile that into some uniform format, but that seems a little bit like too much hardness for this purpose. After all, I didn't get unlimited time to organize that. But the thing is, uh, if you want to uh, have something that runs the code, typically what you do, you provide either virtual machines that support certain code and they're already properly sandboxed. And you also inevitably uh, need to limit the number of uh, languages that you, that you support. If you come up with a better, um, or you can ask them to submit WebAssembly or LVM, but then I don't really see that much purpose on that because that's essentially, it's, it's pretty well obfuscated. So I, there will be no way to see the code. But I'm very open to solution. I mean, like the purpose of this talk is hopefully get someone excited about all these prospects. So if someone wants to run something similar here, I'll be happy to consider more elaborated approaches. The problem is that I was pretty much the only person developing this while having to teach classes and do research. So yeah, obviously I went uh, for the most, for the simplest solution. Other questions? That was a good one. No? All right, wonderful. Let me continue then. Okay, so uh, I hope you are not too bored because I'm going to essentially repeat the story but show how I have done it on a larger scale. So uh, I was very obviously very excited about this idea of running the competition based on some geometric problems. And what happened that two years later, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm a researcher. 
So I'm doing research in programming languages, and there is a community of people who do research in programming languages. And before the pandemic, we used to go to conferences every like like twice, three times a year. So there are four major conferences in programming languages taking place all year round. And nowadays they're always the old Zoom, but slowly going back to normal. And uh, one of this community, one of these conferences that is run by the community is called ICP, which stands for International Conference on Functional Programming. So uh, that's conference I quite regularly publish it. Uh, and so do other members of this department. And uh, it's a fairly old one. So it's been running for 20 something, 25 years. Uh, and one distinguished characteristic of this community and this conference is that it also comes uh, with uh, a programming competition attached to it. But first to give you some glimpse of what YCP is a conference that you probably want to keep your eye on if you're interested in programming languages. Well, one way or another, if you take classes on programming language implementation with Martin or myself, you will probably read papers like this. Okay, quick check. Okay, that one you probably have seen like, okay. So everyone who has written some Haskell code notes knows the word monad. So as a mechanism, and this is where it came from. So this is the, this, this is the concept that came from this community and the pub papers were published uh, at this particular conference. So Phil, Phil Wardler is a very famous researcher there. Okay, and as I said, this conference also, like the community is a little bit goofy. So we publish research papers, but we also like to have some fun activities that used to promote functional programming because believe it or not, 15 years ago, no one really cared that much about Haskell or Camel or Scala. Well, nowadays functional programming has won. So everyone knows at least one functional programming language. But back then, like the way to promote programming languages was to run this programming competition called ICHP Programming Contest. And that is a contest essentially, which very much inspired the format of uh, these competitions that I've run at this year. So it goes for 72 hours. Typically it takes place from Friday to Monday in summer as a long weekend. And it's a free context, contest, anyone can participate. Teams of any size from anywhere in the world, free of charge. And there are small monetary prize, but essentially the main prize is to be able to brag that the language you use to solve the contest is the best one. That's like the bragging rights is the main prize on this contest. And you also get to present uh, your solution at the conference. It's not a publication, it's just a fun stuff. And uh, the history is quite diverse. So typically uh, there is a team from uh, a bunch of researcher, researchers from different universities who organize a contest, a contest each year. So, and if you look at the contest page, it's pretty like uh, it's pretty spectacular. So, like the first contests were organized by Harvard and MIT and Cornell and UPenn and like more recently by Edinburgh, and I think uh, so. This 2017 was by Oxford. Uh, I think this one by Microsoft Research uh, uh, Seattle. Anyway, so at some point they came to me. So and they asked, so why? Like since you run these competitions locally, why don't you do that? So uh, I said, okay, fine, let me try to do that. And I tried, I was inspired by this contest uh, that they ran in 2012, like, uh, which was based on the game Boulder Bash. Does anyone know game Boulder Bash? It's like this super old game is 40 years old where you push the boulders so they wouldn't fall and you will eventually like put them into certain positions and you reach the exit. So like that was actually a super cool contest. You can find uh, the video on YouTube of the organizers. Uh, the legend was, uh, you know, the humanity is using so much functional programming, it runs short of lambdas. So we need to mine these lambdas from the caves of Scotland. And uh, lambda mining was a process of navigating in these mazes to trying to collect as many lambdas as possible without collapsing uh, the boulders, which was super fun. And I just said, okay, that's, that's a fun idea. Let me expand on that. Uh, by the way, there were other contests. So this is probably like the, one of the coolest one in the recent history. Uh, you are given this shape and you are given a square piece of paper and you need to figure out how to fold this paper according to the origami bending rules to get as close as possible to this shape. So this is the contest where people like literally were practicing origami uh, with their hands while writing the, the solvers for this problem. But okay, that was obviously organized by some Japanese institution. Yes, uh, I think this is extremely poetic and a really, really cool problem. Yeah, there was also some like lots of graph theory usually comes in this contest. So like this is from Oxford. In Oxford, they have reverse and they do punting. And that was about kind of navigating through the network of uh, reverse in the most efficient way, obviously collecting lambdas. Like there's always lambdas there. So in 2019, uh, we organized this contest. 
And well, like with the legend, we were not particularly original. So uh, essentially what we did, we said, okay, you know, we are now in a world with functional programming one, and we have all this rotten bit rot code that is just smelly. So we need to put it somewhere. So we are going to put it into this very same caves of Scotland where the lambdas have been mined for, but we need to insulate those caves. So we are going to use these robots who are going to wrap, wrap uh, these caves into, I don't know, plastic, plastic wrap. So for insulation. So this is a robot that a picture that my wife did. Uh, and we call him Rappy or worker wrapper. So essentially the problem was uh, uh, dedicated to programming uh, uh, this Rappy robot to cover the surface of, uh, of a cave with a few steps as possible. Looks simple, right? So this is a Rappy. So you see this the shape, these are its uh, brushes. And well, here below, you can actually see the sequence like DDD, uh, W, there are also, it can also can turn around. So basically you need to produce the string of these characters. And the, sh and the, the shorter the string is, the better, the better is the solution. So robot navigations problem are fairly common here. By the way, students at Yale US who take my data structure class, they solve it to a version of this problem as their final, as their final project. It sounds too easy. Well, let's ho see how about that. So we also can have bonuses. So like robots, they not only clean these uh, caves, they also have additional uh, bonuses to attach. So they, there's bonuses, they're just scattered in these caves. So for example, the robot can have a new controller. So you see, it has just picked a new brush and now it got the extended one. <laughs> okay, what else? We can make the robots move faster. So here the robot, it picked an extra bonus that now for every step it makes two. Uh, it's, going go, it's going to get crazy. So for, how about that? The robot, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, this one, the robot can pick a drill and that allows it to cut the, cut the walls. And now you see how this problem actually starts getting more interesting because not you just have like basically like do the basic path finding and set covering. You also have like these bonuses that you can optimize. And you also, we have this mysterious points, the purpose of which will be announced later. So initial task, we generated a bunch of maps. We uh, made um, a target function to optimize and we released that. So the maps, as you can imagine, were generated the very, using the very same thing that I have described before. So like maps were looking like this and like this and like this and like this. Yeah, so actually I have a paper about this, um, uh, this generator if you, if you want to read. Okay, but that was not just fun. So we also have maps like this. No, people are usually very good in recognizing the shape of their own country, but not the other countries. Who knows which one is it? France, yes, you know, that is a, <laughs> this answer is easier to get in Europe. This one, okay, the US, okay, everyone knows that. Okay, again, enterprise, I couldn't get like, oh, sorry, I just like this one. <laughs> okay, and you can see it's like all literate with these obstacles and also like these colorful dots, there are, there are the bonuses. And then like typically this contest goes at 72 hours, but like if I just give one problem to this super skilled programmers, actually there is some nice, very interesting ethnic fact about those, uh, the participants in this contest. While typically several dozens of countries participate, uh, the three countries are always the most prominent and you would never guess which ones. Any guesses like in top three? Sorry, Israel would be a good guess. They like algorithms, but no, not Israel. Uh, UK is like, okay, let's top five, uh, but not top three. Vietnam, okay, not, 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 okay. Vietnam does some, have some participation, strong masculine. Okay, top three in this order usually are Japan, Russia, and United States. So uh, I guess Japanese are just competitive and the Russians love programming, I don't know for what reason, but for Japan, it's absolute heat. Actually, there is a bunch of teams for whom it's like a Christmas morning. They train, like they work at Google and they train the whole year long just for this contest to participate and humiliate everyone. So that's, that's what typically happening is happening every year. Okay, so, but if I just give one problem, that's not gonna be interesting. The way this contest run, like after like seven or 12 or 15 hours into the contest, we start releasing extensions. And now about the extension. So one thing that we did, we did the teleports. So now we can set the beacons and we can make the robot transport to any location. 
So in practice, that looks somewhat like that. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's see. Like boom. You see, it has jumped back because it has previously set the beacon there. Once again, boom, set the beacon. Boom, jump. Uh, okay, and this is an absolute kicker. Uh, the robot can also clone itself at these dedicated points. And now you can see how this problem really becomes non-trivial. Because if we can create clones, we get into ourselves into the parallel process and optimization. Like, like it wasn't particularly hard before. Okay, and this is the way it goes. So uh, we extended the task. We provided the more interesting maps like this. I think this is Indiana. This is one of the one of the states in, in the US. Uh, anyone? Wow. Yes, this is Greece. This one. Yep. This one. Sorry. Okay. Really, really solid geography skills. Uh, I also have this one. Oh, actually. Uh, okay. Let me. Let me. Do. Yeah. So I also have this one. There was a web interface for making the solution. So the nice thing that there was a web page, which actually didn't require a collection to the server. So it could run offline. So that is all JavaScript. So like typically you get something like this. Anyone? Okay, this is heavily distorted. What do you think? Like what, what was the initial shape? This is Singapore, I'm sorry. It's just like the island is kind of extended and I wanted it to fit to the square. Like I didn't mean it as a, as a joke or an offense. It's just like I wanted to make like more square uh, along, along the directions. And then, well, there's a web form so you can submit uh, your solution, you can submit uh, uh, the, the map, and then you can uh, uh, you can uh, do something like that. So you can express this. So this is this is a super stupid solution. This is something that the solver that I have written like in 20 minutes has produced. Like obviously it's not optimized. It picks the bonuses. It uses them right away, so it doesn't really try to do anything interesting with with optimization and whatnot. I want to, I'm really proud about this visualization. So this is a couple, this is something that I want to say about. So like Martin has just spent the whole hour talking about how curious JavaScript is as a language. So the interesting reality of today is pretty much everything compiles to JavaScript nowadays. So this is JavaScript. It runs in my browser. You can probably hear my computer. Yeah, so it runs in the browser. But I didn't write a single line of JavaScript for that. It's all written on Scala. And it's compiled to JavaScript uh, using the Scala to JS compiler. Fun fact about Scala to JS: uh, one of the main maintainers of the library is the son of KM Lee, who is a who is a programmer by education. <laughs> Did you know that? We probably should we probably should invite him for one of the Friday hacks. You try it, okay? So I presume he's quite high profile. So I'm not very surprised. Anyway, I was actually quite surprised to learn that because I first used this library, I ran this whole contest, and then through Twitter swear, I figured out, okay, that person whose, whose code I used is actually the, the maintainer of the library. That was only the half of the contest. Let me spend the next five minutes telling you about the second half and then to wrap up. Typically, these contests, they come with a twist in the, in the middle. So 24 hours, not really in the middle, in, after the first story. So 24 hours, into the contest, the rules typically change drastically. And everyone knows that, and everyone knows that this is coming. So we try to turn the tables. And this is what we did. So, you know, here's this. Oh, by the way, I. Sorry, dude. How do I stop you? Uh, okay, this is how I stop you. I wrote this thing, I should know. Okay, so uh, you know how this, like, there were like all these nice bonuses, but we had to collect them. Wouldn't it be nice if we could purchase them? somehow. But this is so much against the spirit of the contest. We cannot really, I mean, say, it, okay, it's not PUBG. So like, uh, we cannot make people like pay for the boosters. Right? Right? Or can we? Well, you know what, like, if we asking people to pay for these boosters that help them to like get the like, better solutions in the contest, shall we do it with Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else? The funny part that uh, like that was like about the week when there were like lots of news about how cryptocurrencies are ruining the world and how they are hitting the atmosphere, which is all bad. So we just said, okay, fine, we are making our own currency, Lambda Coin, and this is going to be not like green currency that doesn't require any 
heavy mining. Like, you know, no proof of work. Instead, we are going to use the new protocol called proof of wrap. So what's the idea here? Obviously, okay, you can see it's all a joke. But the idea here is that people already have this machinery to take uh, the escapes and solve them for the robots. So what we started to do, okay, how about you, instead of uh, uh, solving the, the problems, you will start suggesting the problems. So that was not decentralized. We had a server for that, but that server had a timer. And every 15 minutes, we were collecting a bunch of, uh, we were collecting a bunch of problems from people who did best in the previous round. So like the zero, the genesis block, that was a problem provided by us. For the next 15 minutes, people need to solve it. And they also need to generate candidates for the next round. Amongst those who solve the best, we run a lottery and we choose randomly. Okay, we distribute the money according to the quality of the solution between like the first 15. And then, okay, there are lots of rules, but essentially the gist is that when people submit the solutions for the previous block, they also need to provide the problem for the next block. And the only thing we do, we run a bunch of sanity check that this is a legitimate problem. So we can actually use it for the next block. And voila, we have a blockchain. So every block is a problem. You solve it, you get Lambda coins, and you get to present a new problem for the next one to solve. I think this is very much in the spirit of the blockchain. So it kind of keeps going. I mean, obviously this is not a real blockchain. It's not decentralized. It's not asynchronous because we have around every 15 minutes, but that's the spirit. And like what's most importantly, now we can allocate some currency as the rewards for the quality of the solution. The essence of it, to get awarded Lambda coins, one has to hold, solve the current blocks task and propose the task for the next block. And the block reward is proportional to the quality of the solution. So basically we, I don't remember, we pick like the first 10 or the first 15 quality and proportionally to the quality of the solutions, we distributed the reward. And obviously we excluded the team who proposed the current block from the competition of this particular round. Otherwise that would be unfair. People would heavily optimize for, uh, for this thing. Okay, Ob okay, that's what I said. Initially we, so the conference itself this year was in Germany. So we proposed map of Germany as a Genesis block. And then we were expecting that people would start contributing something nice. So, okay, there's a bunch of rules, basically like not too sparse, not too small, somewhat interesting, like some obstacles fits into the certain size and the size was growing to increase the complexity. And well then uh, dependent, uh, so, okay, there was some small economic analysis that I ran on a spreadsheet over the evening to compute how much we should make the cost of different boosters. And obviously I have miscalculated because guess which booster everyone ended up buying. No. Clones, of course, parallel speed up, parallel processors, like hell yeah. I mean, like, why would you buy anything else if you can just run the second robot that will do, will do the same work? And in practice, I think we should have like made it like 10,000 or whatnot, because that was just, uh, it was given such an advantage. Anyway, so uh, we provided uh, this, this infrastructure and whatnot. And uh, basically, if you don't spend your Lambda coins, then they are recomputed into your score and then added. And there is actually a very interesting trade-off. Whether you hodl and you don't spend your coins and they add it to your final score, or you start spending them and you can uh, increase your score. But, uh, and this is actually, it was like a very interesting aspect. There was some Nash equilibrium involved there at some point. Okay, so now the contest becomes like this feedback loop. The better your algorithm, the more coins you can get, the more coins you can get, the better you can find solutions by utilizing the boosters. And there was like, there was like the boosters were not single shot. Basically like every time you submit a solution, you can uh, re redistribute your boosters between, between different, uh, different maps that you are solving. And this is where I think interesting things started to happen. Okay, so kind of covers here with the Zoom. We had hundred, close to 200 registered teams. Not every single team ended up submitting something. Some of them just read the specification, tried and got bored probably. So finally we got, 142 teams who submitted something like overall that many submissions have been made in the course of this uh, three days. Uh, actually didn't spend that much CPU time grading. Like we prepared for 10 times that we got some uh, pretty heavy AWS servers for grading, but that was not necessary. Geographical distribution, uh, 
Okay, actually, I said Russia was second. No, actually, Russia was third on this one. So you say you say came second. I was seriously going around and like asking everyone to participate, but eventually it's the whole weekend in the summer. So not that many people decided to. Uh, so when Jewish contacted me for this talk, that was before I see fee contest this year. I wonder if anyone has actually participated in, in this year. It was always fun to watch on Twitter. So there were these pictures of uh, some, some hackers in Russia sitting in the offices in Siberia and uh, spending time. This is in Spain. This is actually the institution where I used to work and they had a team competing from there. Uh, some funny tweets. Actually, okay, it's like, you need to be a Japanese or a Russian speaker to, to really uh, get the full spirit of the contest because that's when the Twitter starts populating by this, uh, by this ones. Okay, I don't speak Japanese, but Google Translate does. And this one I liked. Basically, the idea is, oh, now we know who is organizing the contest. Let's try to reverse engineer what they will do by reading the papers of the corresponding person. <laughs> okay, the numbers, the histogram with the number of people in each team, quite a few people compete alone, but there were also teams up to 12 people. That was not prohibited. Uh, languages. Okay, that's something that everyone is very much interested in. Surprisingly, the most popular is still C++ and the second Python, but uh, usually the most highly ranked teams, they use Rust. So Rust, I think that that's the language that unofficially won the competition in the last few years. And this is also something like some other like interesting, like Kotlin, Scala, Go, you have it. Something, something, something. <laughs> this is the person who did the solutions by hand and involved all his family, wife, and three kids into helping him uh, producing these solutions. <laughs> How do I know it? Because that was in the readme for the code that he has submitted for like, uh, that was, we could uh, ask whoever wants to submit the code for us to look at, please do. And that, that was in the readme. Like, okay, lots of fun, not that much, much, much code. So my wife and kids helped me. Well, good family building exercise, I guess. Okay, so submissions per hour, that's the same thing. So this is where we were closing the lighting division. This is the mid, like unofficial middle of the contest, first 24 hours, and then, and then that's the rest. So what's more interesting is how exactly the blockchain was evolving. So we had our own like block explorer. We run this uh, mining for 39 hours. Uh, and like, this is how many candidates for blocks were submitted. We, this is how many blocks we were mined, uh, mined. And this is how many Lambda coins we have awarded. So this is like statistics of how many were like block candidates submitted, how many of them are valid. This is like not very interesting. Uh, what is interesting is what, like now you might wonder what exactly those problems in the blocks look like. So we kind of were hoping that according to the constraints, we provided people would submit something like that. Ah, mm -hmm. they submitted this and this and this. <laughs> so actually, this is a very devious one. This is the candidate that satisfies absolutely all the restrictions with all bonuses going at the end and here is something that um, this team realized. You know, the uh, reward would be divided between the teams with the first 10 or 15 results, but not 15 top teams, 15 top results. So it might have been 100 teams who all got the same result. Therefore, the more teams you have who shared the good result, the thinner you, sp uh, you spread the reward. So they realized if they produce a map that admits precisely one unique solution, then everyone will solve it in exactly the same way. Just going like that. Everyone will be a winner and everyone will get a tiny fraction of the reward. Instead of giving a map like this where there are a massive amount of strategy and the one with the better and the team with a better algorithm will clearly get the, the, the main snatch. So that's, uh, that was the thinking. I think it's rather devious. Also kind of like makes you think like this is what like, this is the hacker's way. Okay, the distributions of mined coins by the team. So like one, the team on the top right corner, you cannot see that's the team Unagi. That's a Japanese team that pretty much wins it every year. So the good economical question, should you spend the Lambda coins or should you hodl them? Yeah, and I told you that if you hodl, you get them added to your score. But if you spend, you might use pretty sweet bonuses. and. The point is that the competition and the way the scores for the problem, like the main problems for computer, that was a zero sum game. 
in a way. And the score, like if you manage to become the first team like with the best score, it brings everyone else's score down for the corresponding problem because that was computed as relative. So like basically, if you get the best one, you get one proportional like with some, with, some, with some factor depending on the size of the program. And if you're worse, well, you get only a fraction of one. Uh, in any event, so you see like the best, the best which is the minimal to, to each team. Okay, and this is something that didn't become apparent. So like uh, essentially what we have seen, okay, this is a very sweet visualization. So this is how the wealth of Lambda coins of the teams was growing over the time. And at some point they were like all collecting and collecting and collecting and enjoying it. And then, and then something changed. And then team, uh, one team realized, oh, if you start spending, you actually have bigger, bigger gain because you can buy clones and you can solve better. And this is just like tipped the equilibrium. After that, everyone was like, everyone was spending. And uh, the team that won, they even had like a, a solver to compute which problem they need to invest into the most in order to bring the competing team scores down in the most efficient way to become first in the, in the, most, in the most of the problems. Yeah, so basically you can see that like from the teams that initially had the largest wealth, none of them are there because they spent all of that on two boosters. And there was this Russian team who were actually the organizers of the next year context in 2020. They, I think they didn't figure out what to do with the money and they just were holding them. And it actually didn't help them that much. I think they were in top 15, but anyway. So uh, out of 12 million Lambda coins, uh, most of them were spent and 99% were spent on clones. So that was a very interesting thing to resolve. Okay, so for the results, okay, this is, these are the slides from the conference. The lighting round was won by one French dude who's a pretty, pretty cool strategy. And here's this video, which I'm just going to skip. And for the main division, we essentially what we had, we had the judges prize, which for, uh, for the most creative use of booster. And you can see that some teams, okay, now like from here on, you will mostly see the Japanese names. So uh, you can see that most of the teams they actually didn't use just one language. Like this team used what at least five different languages, or, and probably even more if you count shell script and whatnot. Yep, this one is pretty large. These are their slides, so this is what they provided for their two minutes of glory to explain their solutions. Uh, then there is this team uh, and this team written in C++. Uh, pretty much all of them included some sort of render. Uh, this is actually pretty sweet because it shows the power of parallel computing. You can see they always go first for these purple ones, which are the clones. So like they just ignore everything. They just rush for the clones right away to, uh, to get the maximum parallelism uh, right from the start. Yeah, and those, okay. So this is, this is their, their puzzle. And then for the first, we have this team Monagi, which are the, like basically six people were working for Google. And I don't know what else they're doing in their life, but they are competing a lot. So, and they all have some like non trivial positions at top coder and, and uh, other, other competitions. Anyway, so obviously as like the reason I'm saying that like this competition, 99% of the teams that participate in it is just for fun because it's a fantastic team building exercise. You get to use whatever languages you want. You can use whatever technology. And even if you get into 50, that usually gives you a big sense of satisfaction because you have sold something non-trivial. Yeah, actually for the team Unagia, they were so cool that they actually, so this is the, uh, a room that says Unagi in, uh, in the maze-like form. And that was one of their submissions. And in fact, it was made. They program everything in Rust. Okay, to finish, uh, I've told you about these two experiences of running a small contest from geometry program problems at university level and then running it at worldwide level. And I'm kind of getting old and tired to do it all by myself. Uh, and there are just so much fun in it. So if any one of you feel compelled to organize something like this here at School of Computing, I would be happy to uh, participate in it and, uh, uh, and sort of otherwise. So, okay, this is the stack of technologies we used for the contest. And then, okay, my, my go-to language is usually Scala and also Scala.js, which, which produced the backend. Sorry, front end for the rendering. I don't know if any one of you managed to catch the contest of this year. I think it was an extremely cool problem. It was inspired by this Japanese game called Human Tetris, uh, where you have this uh, soft foam ball that moves onto you slowly, and you need to make a pose and fit into this wall. Otherwise, it will uh, it will knock you off the the platform. 
And this is amazing. I think like, okay, this is such a Japanese thing. Although the, the organizers were Belgians. So, uh, uh, so the problem was essentially like you're given a shape, you can recognize the shape, the page and homage, and you have like a hole and you need to yank the shape in the most closed way, according to some rules of stretching to the corners of the hole in order to get the maximal points. And it was quite fun. So like, for example, they have the, the shape of, I, know, I guess it's a coffin, right? And, uh, and a corgi. <laughs> so yeah, or something like that. Uh, that was, I think it's a, it's a fantastic problem. And I also very much like that they paid homage to the previous context, contest doing this thing. Uh, so to take away from this talk, okay, I think I'll, I'll be wrapping up. I've been speaking for more than an hour. Computational geometry is fantastic. Uh, if you have a uh, passion for elegant problems, uh, this is where many of them come from. And well, those problems can be turned into competition for fun and uh, education. This is actually the logo of UCL where I used to work in. And this is, this is also from the very first problem. By the way, Martin and me were both in the programming language slash software engineering part of the department. We have seminars with invited researchers. You can find the link if you Google for my name, it will be very prominently close to the top of the page. And also, well, we have a lab where we do lots of research on uh, software engineering, testing, verification and programming language design for systems, blockchains, concurrency and compilers. So if this is something that is of your interest, so please don't hesitate uh, to get in touch. This is all for today. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Prof. Ilya. Uh, any questions from the floor? Uh, what is the functional programming part in this contest organized by ICFP? Uh, what's the first part of the question? What is the functional programming part? Functional programming part. Okay, great question. So, tradition. So, this context when it just started, like in early 2000, uh, its main goal, or I think even like 1998, that's when it took place the first time. You can look up. Uh, I think the goal was to design problems in a way that they would promote the use of functional programming. Like, pretty much any problem would involve writing some sort of a compiler and functional programming language, they're particularly well suitable for writing compilers. And then historically, it just became about all kinds of fun problems. And nowadays there is not that much of functional programming component there uh, left, except that the fact that the organizers, they usually come from this community. That's, that's pretty much it. It used to be the case that all the winning solutions were written in Okamo or in Haskell. But since then, especially when Japanese Hackers have discovered this contest. It has been taken over. So nowadays it's mostly C++ or Rust. Uh, any other questions? No questions? Wonderful. Let's yeah. enjoy the weekend. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Ilya. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah, that's a really interesting talk about the competition. Yeah. Very well. I'm glad okay. that you liked it.